you have joined the Garland Group webinar on Complaint Management Best Practices. My name is Gay Connell and I'm with the Garland Group and I'll be the moderator today. And just a little bit about the logistics of the webinar. It's going to be 30 minutes long and all attendees are muted. Um, however, if you have questions as we go along in the presentation, please use the chat box and we will save some time at the end to get to those. And whatever we don't get to, we'll reply by email. Today's webinar is one of a series of monthly webinars that the Garland Group holds on the first Friday of every month covering relevant topics for the banking industry. Just some background on Garland Group, we provide security and technology audit services using a continuous compliance process um, as well as a product called RiskKey, which is an enterprise risk management product that manages all regulations and guidelines through the, throughout the bank under one dashboard. In March of this year, RiskKey and Deluxe partnered to deliver a compliance regulatory program. And today, we're very fortunate to have Becky Frederick from our partner at Deluxe to present to us today. Becky is a principal regulatory analyst at Deluxe, and she has practiced law for over 20 years and was a criminal prosecutor. She has served as chief compliance officer and bank secrecy officer for financial institutions, as well as she has worked in regulatory compliance area for over 10 years. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our presenter, Becky. Are you there, Becky? I'm there. Thank you, Gay. You're welcome. Well, today our topic is complaint management and best practices. And we're going to provide some tools and resources for all of you. And let's see. There we go. Lovely picture of Gay. And here's our topics that we're going to be covering today. I'm going to talk about the key requirements and emerging issues, provide the best practices for complaint management, talk about integrating consumer protection and UDAP, and then provide a checklist for you. So what our goal is today is to outline an effective strategy for you to get out in front of these requirements and implement changes in a manner that makes sense to both your account holders and to your bottom line. So first issue that I want to talk about today is the regulatory landscape. Now, we've seen some action from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and previously we had complaints that could be lodged with the FTC. Now, the CFPB, under the Dodd-Frank Act, has been charged with sharing consumer complaint information. So what the CFPB has done to date is they've entered into an agreement with the FTC to have complaint information shared by the CFPB and the FTC through the FTC's Consumer Sentinel system. And this allows the CFPB to access consumer complaints that are lodged within this system. At this point in time, access is limited to certain government entities, including several states' attorney generals, including Idaho, Michigan, Mississippi, North Carolina, Ohio, Oregon, Tennessee, and Washington, the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, the FBI Internet Crime Complaint Center, and um, the Better Business Bureau also provides information here on complaints. This was the first step that the CFPB has taken now to be enhancing what it's going to do for complaints. In October, we saw the CFPB post um, its CFPB Supervision and Examination Manual stating it was a guide on how the CFPB will supervise and examine consumer financial providers under its jurisdiction for compliance with federal consumer financial law. The manual includes a template for documenting information on financial services and products, including complaints, and unfair acts and deceptive practices, or UDAP, product and service reviews. Now, I can tell you the Garland Group, I'm working with them on this, we're developing a risk assessment incorporating these requirements. But I want to call it out to you because even if you're a financial institution under $10 billion, this is still of interest to you. In the press release where they announced the supervision manual, they called out again that the CFPB has authority for consumer protection issues. 
So look for that risk assessment to be posted in the next couple of weeks. Well, then what the CFPB did next, you did. thirty-first, they published in the Federal Register their request for comments on the collection, monitoring, and response to consumer complaints for financial services and products. And complaints are due by the end of December. Very clearly, the tone is changing. So what is the tone that's been changing? We've seen our examiners come up with a greater focus on complaint management. It used to be it was pulling the complaints and taking a look at Reg B or truth and lending type complaints. Now we're seeing examiners asking for complaint logs, asking for complaint processes and management, and we're hoping to address this today. Some of the key requirements and issues that are coming up key focus is on consumer protection. And here I want to mention the enforcement. I talked briefly about the CFPB, but we also see enforcement action from our state attorney general. I was at a conference out in Washington and I heard that AG, attorney general, does not stand for AG. It stands for aspiring governor. Bringing action against a financial institution can raise that profile for the attorney general. We have to pay attention to aggressive enforcement actions. Next, new requirements. Here is what I'm talking about from that examination manual and UDAP reviews. Next, we also have uncertainty and doubt. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau does not have a confirmed director. What are they going to be doing in 2012? But we do know we see that increased focus. So what are the core requirements when you're looking at a complaint management system? Here, we want to focus on the nature of complaints. A complaint can be verbal. It can be someone coming up to a teller and saying, I don't like your interest rate. It can be written, someone sending a letter to your board of directors. What you need to do is you have to take a look and sort those complaints to sift them from true customer service issues into compliance issues. You need to log them, log your response, and make sure you apply compliance oversight to look for issues or themes that could be addressing consumer protection. Again, I'm calling this out because this is what our examiners are saying when they're looking at complaints. If someone has a number of complaints about a checking account disclosure, does that disclosure need to be redone to make sure it's more consumer friendly? So here I wanted to talk briefly about the life cycle of a complaint. And here what we want to see that you do is that by having a pro an appropriate complaint management system, you can be prepared for what you're going to do when that complaint comes in. Take the complaint as an opportunity to respond and show what good service you provide and how much you listen to your customers. So building your process for complaint management from end to end, here are some of the points that you need to make sure you're addressing. Now we started building this out at Deluxe um, from the Dodd-Frank mandate earlier this year. And the first step we took was we did an inventory of every place where a complaint could come in. And that's this second point um, that we mention here on coming in from external groups. Complaints can go to the Better Business Bureau. Make sure you are appropriately linked in to make sure the Better Business Bureau knows where to send those complaints to, rather than just keeping them and not having somebody at your institution they can send to. Complaints can go to your third-party service providers. Step number one is doing that inventory so you know all the places where a complaint could be coming in. This was an eye-opener for us because you can't make sure you're appropriately addressing everything unless you first make sure you receive all of your complaints. So what are the key components that you need to develop? You're going to need to have policies and procedures. You're going to need to have audit readiness where you can demonstrate what you're doing. And of course, you're going to need to have metrics, tracking the numbers, so you can show how many complaints came in. You're going to have to provide employee training. 
again, here it's looking at how historically we've looked at complaints, separating customer service issues from a bona fide complaint, and then making sure that you have the appropriate analysis and resolution. So we call out some steps that you can take. First one is developing those metrics so you can show your overall numbers. Create a dashboard for management and your board of directors. We're looking at, through RISC-Key, developing a complaint management risk assessment as well. So you can have that visibility to show what the numbers are. Identify the key roles in your financial institution for where that can come in. Who in operations should they roll up to? In my mind, you always want to make sure you have compliance involved within the complaint process, specifically to be looking at those complaints that may be an indicator of a compliance issue. And you need to know when it's going to go to your board of directors, what key complaints need to be escalated to make sure that they're aware of them. Next, make sure you incorporate into your contracts with your service providers information and requirements to make sure they give that information on any complaints they may receive to you. So for metrics, some points we wanted to call out. First, is there a spike in complaints? Second, new products and services. Make sure you're looking at complaints there. Always it can be a sign that there's an issue with a disclosure. If people are questioning what does this mean, take a look at how your disclosure explains what it means and can that be done easily, more clearly. Next, look for changes in customer behavior. And then social media. Social media, you know, you can have a policy in your institution to talk about social media but complaints now can go viral in social media very quickly. Let's talk about Bank of America and the $5 fee increase that was planned. Very clearly, that went viral. Also, 200,000 account holders signed a petition protesting that. We saw that result in a change to that fee, but through social media and other places where the consumers complained, there had to be some type of responsiveness. So while at your institution you may feel you don't need to monitor social media, you certainly want to for complaints because complaints can come in through social media. And now we have an emerging issue coming through UDAP and what we're looking at here. And with UDAP, we also want to bring in the role of the State Attorney General. And here again, I call out juggling to distinguish between a true customer service issue and a true compliance complaint. So when our regulators are looking, they are focusing on those compliance complaints as opposed to customer service issues. And in customer service issues, that can be someone saying, I don't like the hours of the ATM. Make sure you have a process to differentiate and a policy to differentiate, addressing how you will do that so you know what you will be tracking for here. Also, taking a look at your marketing practices because consumer complaints can come up through those marketing materials. Make sure they are straightforward and adequately explain what those pro programs, products, and services are. So it brings us back to UDAP again. And we've seen a big change in UDAP through the Dodd-Frank Act in adding abusive practices. Consumer protection has clearly gained regulatory prominence. But what other drivers are consumers bringing? Two events show this prominence. This is the Occupy Wall Street movement and Bank Transfer Day. The Occupy Wall Street movement is now on day 77. It surpassed the length of Kim Kardashian's recent marriage. But this one isn't going away. It's continuing. 
and this grassroots movement has clearly grown to other cities. Now, while the style of the movement may not be perfected, the substance of the protest is clear. And this is something that all of us in the financial services industry need to pay attention to. Consumer backlash against banks is very clearly out there. That results in greater complaints coming forward. We have to be paying attention to this consumer backlash. Bank Transfer Day, that was November 5th. We had a local ad here in Minnesota that showed a large Minnesota credit union where the man, a woman and a man are going and standing in the teller line. And as they progress up to the teller line, their clothing is taken away until they're just standing in their underwear. Now, the ad was very clever, but it underscored the consumer backlash against fees. And this is something that we need to be paying attention to. This local credit union went from averaging 800 new accounts a month to since they started running the ad, averaging 2,000 new accounts a month. Something to pay attention to. Couple that with the focus on UDAP and misrepresentation. And will that misrepresentation result in the consumer going forward to one of our regulators to complain about it you know you need to pay attention. It's a new standard that we are facing for compliance. And we're adding in the abusive nature of it. Here again, I want to underscore the viral nature of complaints today. A complaint can go not to your teller, but now it can go online to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. If you've looked at that website, it's clearly designed for consumers as opposed to our traditional regulatory websites. And we just had a new one launched this week for mortgage complaints from consumers. And that's any consumer. So the viral nature of these complaints, is it going to be posted out on Facebook, is something that lets it grow and that sentiment against your institution grow. Here, the consumer perception. You know, I talked about Occupy Wall Street. A pet peeve to me is the Troubled Assets Relief Program and the public misperception of what's happened with that program. The Department of Treasury recently issued its three-year anniversary report in October of 2011. And what it showed there is that the banks that received the $245 billion in the TARP funds have now the Treasury Department has recovered 256 billion, an 11 billion dollar return to taxpayers. Yet the perception out there is the bailout was throwing money down the drain instead of an 11 billion dollar return and all of those funds had been repaid. Here consumer education can help with this, but we know our community banks didn't receive those funds, yet still we get tarred and feathered with it. Also, a new standard that we've seen is this aggressive sharing of consumer complaints. I began by showing you the database system with the FTC. Agreements have been signed amongst all of the regulators for the sharing of this information. And time frames are being announced by our regulators for when you must respond. NCUA for credit unions shortened its response time to when you receive a letter of complaint from the NCUA, you have to respond within 21 days to that consumer complaint. And where is the CFPB going to play in this? I mentioned their examination process, and I caution you to go and look at that, because you'll see in there that it isn't just those $10 billion banks that fall under there. Because it's a focus on consumer protection, the CFPB will have oversight on these issues. 2012 will be very interesting to track and see what is going forward from the CFPB for looking at consumer complaints. Um, now, do we have any questions that have come in yet? Be a, um, Gay, I just want to do a time check here. No, we're doing fine. OK. OK. Then I wanted to talk about problem resolution here and take a look at it from the customer's point of view. So to us, 
we can look that. We have to answer to our regulator. We have to answer to our board. But we also have to answer to that consumer. And when that account holder slash consumer comes in and has a complaint, it does create a moment of truth for our institution and that account holder. And how your employees handle that situation can directly affect if the consumer escalates, goes viral, sends it to your board, or what happens. Here, when you're looking at training for your institution, your responses and your readiness will demonstrate not just to your examiners, but also, bottom line, to your account holders on what you'll do if they have a problem. And it can be a time bomb. So we have here some information from consumer research that showed 72% of consumers who had a problem with their institution had a negative response where they actually went and left the bank. But if you work with that customer and they have a positive experience, not only will they stay with your institution, but they'll even increase the share of their money that they put into your institution. So treating those complaints helps your bottom line if you treat them responsibly and pay attention to what your account holders are saying. So here I want to highlight again the social media, the importance of social media for complaints. And it shifts our focus through social media and the pace of responding to complaints. So if a complaint goes viral, it can go to consumer groups and it can just spread and go to other places. You know, recently Time Magazine had a panel <clears throat> where they talked about who they were selecting for the man of the year, or the person of the year, excuse me. And Chef Mario Batali was one of the people on the panel. And he said this at this meeting, and I'm going to quote it. So the ways the bankers have kind of toppled the way money is distributed and taken most of it into their hands is as good as Stalin or Hitler and the evil guys. They're not heroes, but they are people that had a really huge effect on the way the world is operating. This went viral very quickly, this quote from Batali, comparing bankers to Stalin and Hitler and acting like we just keep the money that is given to the institution. I call it out because what's our social media landscape today when a quote like that goes viral? Well, it can go to all sorts of different places. Here's just one listing of all the different places, YouTube, Flickr, Facebook, anywhere where these can go. Your institution needs to know if you have a complaint going out there, it can do a lot of damage. We've seen on a retail end that social media can have a huge negative impact to businesses bottom line. Make sure you fold this into your complaint process for monitoring and taking care of. Now, what do you need to do about your senior management? Here, you need to make sure that you've transformed that complaint function. And your senior management needs to be involved with this. They need to know that complaints have to be differentiated now between true customer service and true compliance issues with your products and services. Do a skill set of your employees. Do they know, assess that skill set that they have? to know if they know how to handle the customers when they come in talking about a complaint. And schedule a training plan for what you're going to do next year to take a look at this. And how you document complaints and how you document the resolution. So now we're coming up near the end of our hour, and our half hour, and I wanted to provide a checklist for you. And how are we doing on time? We have five minutes left. And here I have 10 steps that you can all take right now to take a look at your complaint management program as we go into 2012. First, take a look at integrating social media. See how that's going to fit into your complaint management program. Second, UDAP. Here, I'm going to give you the link to the resource in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau for an inventory and assessment for looking at your new products and services to make sure you have folded that into your complaint management process. Next, review the alignment 
and assess the resources you have for the compliance function in complaint management. Number four, the inventory. Boy, I know that was an eye-opener to me. Make sure you know all places where a complaint can go in. Don't forget about your vendors and making sure they are incorporated into that process as well. Next, and this is a 2012 goal as well, identify all of your consumer disclosures and take a look at that across your institution for all products and services and develop a plan to review those in 2012. If you get complaints where the customer doesn't understand, make sure you marry that to reviewing those disclosures. Number seven, training your employees, how they're going to deal with customer-related issues. The angry customers standing in the lobby shouting at everybody and how they need to eliminate their own emotions for there to turn it into a solution for your institution and keep that customer happy. But how to deal with them. And if you have that person shouting in the lobby, move them into a room real quick but make sure you resolve the underlying pro problem. Next, take a look at your board of directors. If you look at enforcement actions, and I always read those to see what we can learn from them, we had a recent very critical telling one from West, um, West Corp Bank Corps, and they talked about their complaint management process there <clears throat> and said the board of directors needed to be involved. Make sure you know when you need to escalate to your board of directors. That can impact your bottom line. This bank was assessed a fine of $330,000. That's a lot of money. Make sure you're taking a look at that and involving your board so they're aware first of your overall complaint management strategy, but then when certain complaints need to be escalated. Number nine. Make sure you integrate complaint management with your marketing practices. Make sure your marketing people know that you need to be looking at the complaints, particularly for new products and services. And last but not least, develop your own complaint management story so you can show your regulator at your next examination, here's our strategy on how we look at this at our institution. Here's what we're doing with these, and here's how we're being progressive about taking care of it. So now I provide some links here for you for going out and looking. First, I provided the link from all the different regulators from what they show. The second link here for the CFPB is to that new supervision manual. And then we have time for a few questions. Do we have any questions coming in, Gabe? Oh, yes, we do. It's a very popular topic today. Um, first of all, there were several questions about getting copies of the slides, and I probably should have mentioned this at the beginning, but we, um, as always, are recording this entire webinar, as well as we'll have a copy of the slides all uploaded to the Garland Group website by the end of day next Monday. So um, check back then um, to get a copy of the slides. Um, okay, one question, Becky said, can you repeat um, where we, you can find the CFPB complaint management template. Sure. Um, let me go back to that. Uh, okay. So here, on the tools and resources, this second link that um, I don't know if my cursor is showing, but it says consumerfinance.gov slash guidance slash supervision manual. And there is um, three attachments contained in there, and it's in the third attachment that is contained on there. So if you have any questions, you know, um, I think, Gay, we've provided our phone numbers on yes. where people can reach us, so don't hesitate to reach out and ask if you can't find it once you're looking. But I can tell you, um, uh, as I mentioned, I've been working with the Garland Group, and we are actually releasing a risk assessment to include that template that the CFPB had. Okay, yeah, and that was another question. What risk assessment would be on risk key? And I think that it, they're both related. So uh, that's currently in review right now, and uh, we will be notifying um, 
there'll be an announcement on RISC-Key when that is released so that you know it's available. Um, okay, one more question. Um, what uh, what about the Better Business Bureau complaint email? Oh, that? oh, that's a really good question. I forgot to mention that. Just this week it came out that there is a complaint email scam that's going on. And I can tell you, I received that myself um, last Wednesday evening. And I was checking email, even though it was the Thanksgiving break. And I saw from the Better Business Bureau, and it said a customer complaint. And right away, I tried to open it up on my home laptop. And now I'm fearful I've infected my home laptop. So I had to run a scan, a virus scan, right away. Here at work, I tried to do it, because I hadn't figured out yet that it was a scam. And our firewall prohibited me from opening it up here at the Lux. But what this is, the Better Business Bureau has had an announcement about it. It's a scam. And you need to delete the email immediately. And um, there, you can notify the Better Business Bureau. But they had a number listed, a telephone number listed on the email. And I called that. And the Better Business Bureau announces that this is fake. But they also had a zip file for the complaint. And the Better Business Bureau said it's their practice never to send out those type of attachments when they're letting an institution know about a complaint. So what it has is it has malicious software. And if you get one, oh, please delete it right away. OK, yeah, that's, that's great to know. Thank you, Becky. Yeah, and okay. especially now with this environment, you know, you see the word complaint and you just jump. You want to make sure, oh my gosh, i got to take care of this right away. Right. OK, well, we're, we've gone a little bit over our time, so that's going to be all the questions we'll take for now. Just a few things to wrap up. Um, as mentioned, uh, Becky and I's phone numbers and emails are on the slide. If you would like to contact us for any other information on this topic or Garland Group, Deluxe, or Risky. Um, also wanted to add that for next month's webinar, we're going to try something new, and we're going to hold a Managing Compliance in 2012 panel, in which will consist of experts that will cover both the IT view, the enterprise risk management view, and as well as an executive view of the current compliance hot topics out there. So later today, when I send out a survey, we'd love to get your feedback on this webinar, as well as I'll be asking for um, just what your current um, questions are for compliance in 2012, and we'll be sure to address those in the next webinar panel. So again, we hope uh, everyone found this webinar very valuable. We'd like to wish all of you a wonderful holiday season, and thank you for joining us today. That concludes our webinar. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Gay.